tonight's subject is live in the end. I dare say that everyone here would say yes to the statement of scripture. With God, all things are possible. I don't think you'd be here if you did not believe in God. And a God to whom all things are possible. But maybe we stop right there and we separate man from God. And my purpose is to show you that we are not two, that we are one. That God actually became man, that man may become God. So let us now tonight give you my reasons for my claims. We turn to the book of John, the Gospel of John. And we are told that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, that's a mistranslation. The word translated among is the Greek preposition in, within. The Word became flesh and dwelt within us, in us. John used the plural us for the nature whereof we consist. That the Word of God, which is defined in Scripture as the creative power of God and the wisdom of God, did not take upon itself some one person among men. For then that one assumed would have advanced and no more. But Christ to save all did not make this man or that man his habitation, but dwelt in us. That same creative word that created the universe and sustains it dwells in us. Therefore with God all things are possible. And therefore with man all things are possible. So he states it in one book, Matthew, with God all things are possible. But in Mark he states it, all things are possible to him, meaning man, who believes. Can man believe? So this creative word is in us. Well, what is this creative word? It's your own wonderful human imagination. That's Christ in man. Man is all imagination. And God is man. And exist in us and we in him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And that is Christ himself. The divine body, Jesus. We are his members. So when you say, I am, that's he. Now, can you believe that you are now the man that you would like to be, though at the moment of your assumption, reason denies it, and your senses deny it? Only just started. So if you're right. Can you really conceive a scene a scene which, if true, would imply the fulfillment of your dream. Just imagine it. Certainly you could imagine it. But the problem is, would you believe it? Would you believe in the reality of the thing imagined? If I could, this very moment, imagine myself into a state, any state at all, and dwell in it. Well, now, what is dwelling in it? Well, I am dwelling in it. Well, that's Christ. And that is the resurrecting power of the universe. So if I remain in a state, I will resurrect it and objectify it in my world. But I have to select it and enter the state. If the spectator could enter into any of these states in his imagination, approaching the state on the fiery chariot of his contemplative thought, what would it be like if it were true? How would I feel if I were now the man that I would like to be? How would I know that I could become it? Well, I first, as I assume that I am it, let me think of my friends. Those who really would rejoice with me were it true. Let me imagine that I am seeing them in my mind's eye. How do they see me? If what I am assuming is true, they should see me as I am seeing myself. And if they are friends, they should rejoice with me. So let me now assume that I am seeing, reflected on the face of a friend, that which, if I saw it, would imply he sees in me that which I have assumed that I am. Will that work? Try it. 
I tell you from my own personal experience, it works. As we are told in Corinthians, do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. Now we are challenged. He said, come test yourself and see. Well, this is how I test myself. If Christ is in me, and all things are possible to Christ, then I must find out who he is. Well, I have found him as my own wonderful human imagination. And because he dwells not only in me, he dwells in us, everything is possible to everyone in the world. And so you help man best by telling him who Christ is. You could give him all the things of the world that he needs. He'll come back for more tomorrow, unless he knows who Christ is. You can give the entire world to any one of us. They'll spend it, waste it, if they don't know who they are. But tell him who he is, and he doesn't need anything more than the knowledge of who he is and the application of that knowledge. For we are the opera power. It doesn't work itself, I can tell you, that your imagination is Christ. And maybe you'll believe me. But unless you actually take it to the point of working upon it and operating it, it means nothing. Well, if this night I really believe it, I would not allow the sun to go down in my sleep unless I feel myself right into the situation of the wish fulfilled. It need not a wish for myself, it could be a wish for a friend, for everyone in my world, because Christ dwells in all and Christ is the true identity of every man, then everyone must be myself pushed out. It can't be another if God is one. Therefore I tell myself as the seeming other what I would do were I you. And instead of giving him the thing that he needs physically, tell him how to get it for himself. What would you feel like if now you were the man that you want to be? How would you see the world if things were as you desire them to be? Now this is what I mean by living in the end. Robert Frost, just the year before he departed this fair, he wrote this story for Life magazine. And he said the founding fathers did not believe in the future. What a shock that they did not believe in the future. They believed it in. He said, we are always imagining ahead of our evidence. And the most creative thing in man is to believe a thing in. They had no evidence to support their claim to democracy. They were under a king when they threw the king away and began to simply build a concept of the future. They did not believe that the mere passage of time would bring them that dream. They believed it in. And these men believed implicitly in the word of God. And they believed that if I know what I want when I pray, believe that I have received it and I will. Well, if that precept is true, literally true, to be accepted literally and fulfilled literally, well then what am I doing not believing? I should actually know exactly what I would like to be and discovering what I would like to be as against what I seem to be dare to assume that I am it. And my assumption though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. That I know from my own experience. And I know it's a law, therefore, if someone is not becoming the man that they would like to be, and they tell me, but I once imagined it and it didn't work, then what are you doing now and still not imagining it? If imagining creates reality, what are you imagining? For if Christ is the only creative power in the universe, and I identify him with my own imagination, well then my imagination is creating reality. So what am I imagining? Because the morning's paper, and I'm filled with everything I should not feast upon, all the horrors of the world, all the negative states of the world, after having read it for an hour, then I must either regurgitate, or in some strange way rub it out, because I can't go along through life feeding upon such nonsense. But if I really know what I want, what you want, what we want, and persuade myself that we have it, if my premise is sound, that imagining creates reality, I should, in the not distant future, hear you tell me that it's worked for you, and the other one tells me, and I in turn tell you, and go through life sharing this marvelous news with others. So I say, live as though it were true just as though it were true. That passage of Shakespeare, we have been taught from the primal state that that, that he which is was wished until he were. 
Here we find it in Caesar. He which is was wished until he were. He wasn't born Caesar, the king. But here was an ambition fulfilled because he was wished into it. He desired it, lived in the state, and everything reshuffled itself to conform to that state to which he was faithful. I see it in my immediate circle. Those who you would not think for one moment would ever become prominent, but they desired to be prominent. Those who desired to be successful, as they conceive success, no two see success in the same manner. Some see it through the eyes of wealth, others through rising in some profession, others in some other manner. But whatever they conceive it to be, they can realize it. If night after night they sleep in the assumption that they are now what they would like to be. And so we go back that if the word is truly the word that creates the system of, in which we live, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. By him all things were made, and without him was not anything made that was made. No, not even the so-called unlovely things. For if all things were made, he has to be responsible for the unlovely things as well. So we are told in scripture, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. I create the blessing, I create the curses. But now I must choose life. Choose the lovely things, but don't say there's another creator. For if there's another creator, then we are in conflict. So my own imagination can conjure unlovely things if I dwell upon them, or the lovely things. But they can't be two gods. They can't be two creators. And if I can find that creator and identify him with my own wonderful human imagination, then I can't pass the buck. I can't turn to anything and blame it for the things happening in my life. But I know that many of us are not discriminating, and when we see our own harvest, we don't recognize it. We can't conceive that we, in some strange manner, permitted these things to be entertained by us. But we did. It could not have come to pass in any other way. So if I believe it and I accept it, well then I will live by it. And then when I know what I want for anyone, and this goes for everything in this world, whether well, now, this very moment, you desire happiness in marriage. You say, but there's no, not one person in my world that's eligible. I know no one. You don't have to know anyone. All you have to do is to decide within yourself what you want. Now, what would you do if it were true? Would you wear a ring on the one finger which would imply that someone placed it there, one that you admire? Well, then, wear it there. Don't wear a physical ring. Put it on just as though he had placed it there. And sleep feeling that which you are feeling as real. Don't say it's all imagination. Certainly it is, because all imagination is Christ. Therefore, it's all reality. So when you say, well, that's only my imagination. Well, you're just saying, well, that's only a thing called Christ. When you treat imagination that way. Is there anything in this world that wasn't first imagined? Name one thing or point out one thing in this world for me that is now considered to be real, that wasn't first only imagined. What is now proved was once only imagined. Therefore, this is a true statement. All things were made by him, and he is your own wonderful human imagination. All objective reality is solely produced through imagining. The clothes you wear, the chairs on which you are seated, this in which we are now placed, everything was once only imagined. Now tonight, find out exactly what you, not what they think you ought to want, what you want. Ask no one's permission. You don't need any man's permission. You don't need your own decision. What do I want? Now what would it be like if it were true? What would I feel like were it true? Now catch the mood and try to give that mood all the sensory vividness of reality, all the tones of reality, and then sleep in it, just as though it were true. And then await the inevitable. The inevitable is you're going to resurrect it and objectify it on the screen of space. And then the world will call it real. And they may not believe you. It doesn't really matter. If you tell them it came to pass because you simply imagined it, 
Now, they'll point to the series of events that led up to it, and they will give credit to the bridge of incident across which you walk towards the fulfillment of that state. And they'll point out some physical thing that was the cause. Now, the cause is invisible, for the cause is God, and God is invisible to mortal eye. Who knows what you're imagining? No one knows. But you can sit down and imagine, and no one can stop you from doing it. But can you give reality to the imagined state? If you do, yes, a bridge of incident will appear in your world. And you'll walk across some series of events leading up to the fulfillment of the imaginal state. But don't give causation to any physical step that you took towards the fulfillment of it. You imagine yourself having a marvelous business. And then comes the day a building is for sale and you haven't a nickel towed. And a total, not a total stranger, but a man comes in and asks you quite in a friendly manner, are you going to buy it? And knowing you don't have a penny, you say to him, as you would a friend to a friend, with what? And then he said, well, I have money. It's only in the bank, but drawing nothing. You say, well, I have no collateral. Well, he said, I watch you. You're an honest person. Your family, they're honest. I think they are. Would you like me to buy it for you? To get my lawyer to bid for it. If they knew that I'm bidding, that I have money, they'll bid me up. And so I get it at the very lowest price by getting a lawyer who represents more than one client and they do not know who he represents and he'll bid for it. Are you willing to take it regardless of the price? And you say, yes, I'll take it. But I have no collateral. All I need is your signature, that you will simply pay 6% on whatever the price is and then reduce that principle over a period of 10 years. Agreed? Yes. But then sign this and we'll see if we can buy it. That day, you owned the building. And you didn't have one nickel when you owned the building that day. You only had your signature on a piece of paper. At the end of 10 years, you repaid the man his principal. You reduced it every year, paying him 6% on the remaining principal, and reduced the entire thing at the end of 10 years. That man dies 20 years later and leaves you 150,000 in cash, tax-free, and a couple of homes and many personal belongings. In the meanwhile, you continue in that business and it multiplies and multiplies. And that year was 1922, 1924. This is now 1968. That building, I'm speaking factually, that building in 1924 is now gone. He paid only $50,000 for it. It was repaid and repaid. A bank, three years ago, bought the property, where the building was rotted, bought the property for $840,000 in cash and no capital gain. From $50,000 to $840,000. In the meanwhile, the business has expanded into all the other islands so that today you couldn't buy them out for $15 million all in imagination. And this goes back to the imagination that preceded this man's offer to buy the building. For the young man, seeing this building and entertaining a thought that the present owners deceived his father and through deception got him out of a partnership, a junior partnership. And he was moved not to get even, but to prove that he really had something within him and could be a success in spite of their deception. And so, every day he would see on that marquee, not their name, but his own family's name. And he would see it in his mind's eye because you could not take their name and transliterate it and make it spell this man's family's name. But he saw it, and in his mind's eye he saw that name, which if true would imply the family owned it. He did it every day, twice a day, for two years. And then came this sudden, out of the nowhere. And the whole thing was made possible, and today they're all over the islands. And they have no partners. They've never taken in one partner, never sold one bit of stock outside of a family ownership. All by imagination. Now I know what I'm talking about because I'm a member of that family. I'm speaking of my own family. This is not hearsay. I know it. My second brother, Victor, was the one 
in whose imagination this whole thing began to bloom. And he still works all by imagination. He knows what he wants, and then after having decided in himself, that's what I want, and that's good for the business, he then in his mind's eye, he appropriates it. And then let things happen. As told us in scripture, the vision has its own appointed hour. It ripens, it will flower. If it be long, then wait, for it is sure, and it will not be late. Read that in the book of Habakkuk. Here is the true translation of that passage in Habakkuk. So when you know what you want, remain faithful to that assumption. And the assumption, though at the moment, is denied by your senses and denied by reason. If you persist in it, it will harden into fact. Are we not told that God calls a thing that is not seen as though it were seen and then the unseen becomes seen? He calls everything from the unseen into the seen in this simple manner. For he is the resurrecting power. So if I assume that I am, I don't have to have evidence to support it. I assume that I am. I am what? Well, I name it. And having given it a name, given it form, given it definition, remaining in it, I resurrect it. And if it takes a thousand men to aid the birth of that state, a thousand men will play their parts. And I don't have to go out and look for them. Any more than my brother had to go out and look for this man. He would not have known where to start looking for one the day of the sale. As far as he is concerned, he had done it in his mind's eye. And he allowed everything to happen. And he comes right in like a joke. He really thought it was a joke. And he said to this man, are you fooling me? He said, no. He said, well then wait, let me call my father. He said, lunch. He called him on the wire, he said, Daddy, come on up, leave everything and come. And then he said, now you tell my father what you told me. My father's name is Joseph. And my father said, you really mean it? He said, yes, Joe, I mean it. I'll have him bid today. You put your signature here, and your son Victor put his signature. That's all I need. And that was a lifetime friendship. So when that man died, he didn't owe my brother Victor anything. He saw love the friendship and the feeling of, well, decency that he had with my brother Victor. He gave him 150,000 cash. And that was tax free. And the homes, everything was tax free. And that building, which he bought for $50,000, was sold three years ago to the Bank of Nova Scotia. They tore it down and built a lovely structure, but they paid our family $840,000 for that building. So here was a gain and there was no cap capital tax gain. None. That whole thing was simply free. So I know what I'm talking about. All I need from you is the acceptance of it. Will you believe it? Will you believe that with God all things are possible? Will you believe that all things are possible to men? Well, you can prove it in the not distant future. But you are the operant power. It will not work itself. If you dare to assume this very night that you have a better job than you now hold or that you have a larger income, you may be fired tomorrow. Don't be concerned. On reflection, you'll see it was necessary to move you towards the fulfillment of your assumption. You could be fired. And I wouldn't bat an eye if you told me tomorrow, well, I did what you told me. You know what happened? I was fired. I have seen that. It takes someone to fire you to get you into a better job. I have seen that time and again. I wouldn't go out and quit the job. You may be promoted in the job, or you may be invited by some other concern that is competitive to join them. I do not know how it happens. I only know if you remain faithful to the assumption it's going to happen, and you're going to be promoted towards the fulfillment of the state that you have dared to assume that is yours. I could tell you unnumbered stories along this nature. So here I say, dwell in the end. The end is where we begin. For if I see my name on the marquee, that's the end. I don't wait for the incident to take place in my world to move from one to the other to the other, leading up to that. I dwell in the end. If I go to the very end, what would it be like were it true? A health case, not how it's going to become better, but you go to the end. And you say to someone, 
who isn't well. And in your mind's eye, you say to them, you know, I've never seen you look better. And have them say to you, I've never felt better. Well, now that's confirmation of what you're seeing. You say, I've never seen you look better. And hear them say to you, well, I have never really felt better. But you may say to me, well, I can't hear people. Oh, yes, you can. You can hear anything you want to hear. You don't have to hear it audibly. Listen to this very moment. You may not be able to whistle a tune. Maybe you can carry a tune in any manner whatsoever. You can play an instrument. You can whistle. You can sing. Well, can you now imagine that you are hearing the battle hymn of the Republic? Listen, can't you hear it? Can't you augment it? A thousand voices, ten thousand voices. Did you hear it at the funeral of Senator Kennedy? Did you see it on TV? Wasn't that moving? When the organ began to peal, and suddenly that lovely soft voice singing it, and the whole thing became, well, the whole vast TV world was filled with it. I doubt there were very many dry eyes when he got through singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, I can sing, I, I can whistle the tune, but I can just sit right now or stand here and listen and hear the entire thing swell. If I try to duplicate it in my, with my voice, I couldn't do it, but I can hear his voice as he sang it. You can hear anyone's voice. You can hear the speaker's voice. Tonight, alone, you can hear my voice. And you can put upon my voice what you want to hear. And I, unknown to you, I will find myself telling you. Something will happen to confirm what you're hearing. So you can do this for good or ill. I advise you, do it for good. But the choice is yours. You can hurt and you can bless, but don't hurt. Use your imagination always lovingly on behalf of others. But to tell you that you couldn't do it to hurt is stupid because you can hurt. But it's entirely up to you. So you imagine what you want. Believe that you have it and see how it works in the world. Those who scoff at it or let them scoff. Five years from now when you're on the top, they may be working for you. And they've even forgotten that they sat in the same audience with you. For you heard and believed, and they also heard, but they didn't believe. And so you moved on, and they remained behind. And that's life. But there's only one creative power in the universe. Scripture names that power as God, Jesus Christ, the Lord, the same power. Because there aren't two gods, there aren't two lords. There's only one. And that one Christ dwells in us. He did not appropriate a single man, as scripture doth, I mean, the priesthoods of the world teach. They tell you of a single man. And they single out a man that differs from all men. He isn't dwelling in this man or that man. His desire was to save humanity. And so he dwells in us, not in that particular man. He didn't become this one man uh, dwelling in one man. No, let no one tell you that the Christ in you differs from the Christ and let them name any man they want. He cannot differ. If there is a Christ other than that Christ who is crucified within us and who rose and continues to rise in humanity, he is a false Christ. And the teachers who teach of an external, objective, different Christ are false teachers. Christ is within and he rises within. And so you go out and put it to the test, put it to the extreme test.